Hey everybody, it's the Razzball Fantasy Baseball Podcast. I am beat on, joined by that handsome looking man across from me. If you're watching on YouTube.com slash Razzball Fantasy, we're just going to keep saying that right off the top until you go watch it and subscribe. Gray Albright, how's it going over there, Gray? Hey man, how's it going? I'm uh, feeling refreshed after the uh, All-Star break. Feeling good, feeling, feeling ready to go, feeling like uh, on top of the world, like Juan Soto after the home run <laughs> derby, am I right? Actually, actually, Juan Soto after he gets traded to the Yankees. <laughs> like, uh, uh, hey, Juan Soto right now is like, oh my God. It's like when you're uh, <laughs> you're about to be taken off life support and you're getting a second lease on life. You're like, oh my God, uh, I'm alive again. I feel I feel refreshed. You know, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, speaking of uh, trades, um, it's so funny to me that like uh, Ken Rosenthal and, and the uh, and the and the real baseball writers, quote unquote, real um, those guys right now are out there like saying like, oh, um, you know, uh, the Yankees or the Mets or whatever so teams are checking in quote unquote on Juan Soto. And it's like checking in on Juan Soto. Mm, okay. <laughs> and like it's like, oh, so uh, you know, you lick the uh the pencil point. Uh so you say he's an outfielder, huh? Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> we could use one of those. Uh is he any good? <laughs> I see this average that he has this year. It, it seems yeah. to be down quite a bit. I, you definitely want less for him now, right? Now that he's hitting two four <laughs> right exactly yeah it's just like so it's such nonsense they're checking in on i'm like oh yeah who, who who is juan soto let me let me open up my uh baseball almanac um so anyway so the home run derby i uh i went to it Woo! <laughs> so uh so this is funny so um I uh, so I get there. Coogs and I we go to the home run derby, right? And uh, our seats are behind home plate. So the only way we were going to get a home run is if Julio Rodriguez homered out to center. The ball traveled around the globe and went back to us behind. <laughs> <home plate. laughs> that was that was like the possibly the worst seats of all time. <laughs> So, so anyway, so, and then, so we're sitting next to, um, Joe Mantiple, the, uh, the Diamondbacks reliever. We're sitting next to Joe Mantiple's, uh, family. And, uh, I said, and I, uh, I say to him like, oh, uh, well, they introduced themselves. They're like, oh yeah, we're, uh, we're Joe Mantiple's family. And I'm like, oh, cool. I actually have him in an NL only league and he's doing like really well for me. It's a, sh he should have made the all-star game and they're like that's why we're here he did make the all-star game <laughs> <laughs> so long story short i always say to kooks i think we should move <laughs> <laughs> so i uh so i dm uh craig mish uh the marlins uh beat reporter i dm him because i know he's going to be there with his kid so I'm like, where are you guys at? Because I figure we'll uh, we could join you, uh, you know, wherever you are. We'll just join you because right now we're getting, you know, the stink guy from Joe Mantiple's <laughs> family, and we have no chance of catching a home run where we are. So anyway, so Craig, uh, so he gets back to me. He's like, oh, we're we're just looking around for seats. Actually, our seats are terrible too. So. Um, He's he says that like he's found a spot where there's a couple empty seats down by the uh, right field foul pole. So he's like, come down here. So I'm like, OK, cool. <laughs> so we uh, so we go down to the uh, the right field uh, foul pole actually doing the home run derby. I don't know if it's like this in every stadium, but for future reference, if anyone's listening, there's no ushers there doing the home run derby. Like it's literally <laughs> like where, wherever you want to sit. It's yeah. kind of like yeah, it's a free for all. So, uh, so anyway, so we go down, but people do have tickets. So if someone were to show up in a seat that we like, you know, quote unquote steal, then they would, you know, have, <laughs> they would have dibs to it and we would have to move. So anyway, so I go down to, uh, so Coogs and I go down to, um, Craig Mesh and his, uh, and his kid down by the foul pole and we're sitting there and, and it's like, honestly, the sun is so bright. It's at, at like. 
five, I want to say it's like five thirty, six o'clock, but the sun is still out. It's LA. It's really bright. Um, it's, uh, it's like impossible to see a ball. <laughs> like, yeah, like literally every time, <laughs> every time anyone hits a home run, like even if it's to like left field, I'll be like, Oh my God, we're going to get hit. <laughs> We're gonna get killed. Like I'm ducking. Like anytime, like the uh, the batter swings, no matter wh- where the ball is hit, because I can't see anything. Like I have sunglasses on, I have my hand up blocking the sun. I still can't see anything. So anyway, so uh, it, we go through um, like I don't know, like maybe two or three rounds, and the only ball that's even close to us, one ball actually hits the foul pole which maybe would have got to us. Like it might have it might have got to us because we are like we're obstructed view. We are literally right behind the foul pole. So that one may have gotten to us, but it hit the pole. So anyway, final round, Juan Soto versus Julio Rodriguez, as everyone knows by this point. Um and uh Julio's put up like, you know, he's hit he hit like I think 62 or 63 homers in the first two rounds combined. He's put up another 20. He's up to like 80 something homers in three rounds. It's like nearly a record. Like the record, I think, is like 90. And then Juan Soto comes up and he has to beat uh, Julio Rodriguez. So it's like, it's, I think it was, uh, it was like the, the next to last homer that Soto hit or the last homer that he hit to, to win the home run derby. The ball goes up, it goes right around the foul pole, and it hits Craig Mish right in the hand, and he catches it and hands it to his kid. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, it was literally, it was, like, the most fantastic, like, father-son moment. I almost started sobbing. It was beautiful. (laughs) It was so, it was honestly, it was so beautiful. I was like, oh, my God. I... It was like his son looked up at him like it was Captain America. It was like, oh, my God, this is like this is so beautiful. This is Americana. (laughs) This is is Americana. I started screaming. This is Americana. So anyway, um, yeah, long story short is Craig. Craig caught like one of the last homers that Juan Soto hit uh, and he gave it to his kid and it was beautiful and. And it ended up being a good time, even though I insulted Joe Mantiplee's family. <laughs> Joe Mantiplee, who does not walk anyone nowadays. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's a that's a fun story, Greg. I'm glad you got to see the Home Run Derby. Although, it sounds like maybe maybe behind home plate with, with Mantiplee's uh, family was the place with the, uh, with the sun right there. But then you wouldn't have got to see the, uh, you know, the, the Mish moment. <laughs> yeah yeah no totally yeah no it was uh it was nice and i went to vancouver the next day after the home run derby which was b- so boring anyway let's get to uh the podcast <laughs> yeah i mean well i'm not gonna let us skip past this just yet because we're gonna start with juan soto i mean we saw what he did last year in the second half so now that he's actually the home run derby champ like 350 20 home runs incoming or are we like what do we think with juan soto he's i mean we know he's a great baseball player but from a fantasy perspective, that first half was not ideal. Okay, so how about how about this trade? The Rockies trade Bud Black to the Nationals for Juan Soto. Can we make that happen? <laughs> and Chris Bryant. They can throw in Chris <laughs> Bryant, too. Yeah. Well, I, actually, the Rockies <laughs> can keep Chris Bryant. I don't care. But if they get Juan Soto, mmm, yummy. <laughs> so I think, you know, I feel like with Juan Soto, his, uh, like his peripherals, They don't look so bad. Like last year, his peripherals looked worse in the first half than they do this year. Like this year, I do think there's a little bit of uh, unlucky Babbitt going on. Like his Ks look fine. His walks look fine. His like his power is actually I think his power is up from where it was at the end of like the first half last year, uh, if I remember correctly. So. He's actually, I think, on for a better year this year outside of batting average. And the batting average, I think, might be a tad low just simply because of the bad luck. So, honestly, I I feel like Juan Soto it could be in for a big second half. And then if he gets traded to, like, the Yankees 
or the Mets or I don't know, who else? The, the, the Dodgers. I mean, it's a, it's a usual suspect, really. It's like yeah. it's one of like four teams. Fill in blank of teams. It's not like the Reds check. are going to suddenly get in on Juan Soto. Uh, <laughs> watch the Reds now trade for him. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, anywhere, like for the most part with trades, like if you're worried, like I wouldn't be worried about like a player losing value in a trade uh, for the most part, because like more t- like more times, nine times out of 10, they're going to a place where the lineup is going to be better because they're a contender. So of course the lineup's going to be better, better. Uh, if the Juan Soto goes to the Yankees, I mean, the right field. <laughs> oh my God, man. You know, like you thought Rizzo was helped by right field. Like Juan Soto could really be, you know, that could really be huge for Juan Soto. So, yeah, I think I I would be a buyer if, like, the the price was, you know, reasonable enough. Like, or not even reasonable, but I guess if it was, like, if it was a fair price. Like, if you're trading, like, you know, in a dynasty league, for instance. Like, you want to trade, I don't know, say uh, Jazz Chisholm. And, uh, like, if you're out of it, I'm saying. Yeah. Like, if a team's out of it and they're trading, like, Jazz Chisholm and a top arm for Juan Soto, sure. Yeah, I mean, I would trade for Juan Soto. Uh, You know, it gets a little bit tricky in an NL only because if he gets traded to the AL, maybe your league then you lose him in your league possibly. For some leagues, that is. And not all leagues. Like, I know in in Tau Wars this year, you're, we won't be losing players if they get traded to the opposite league. But I know and also in our CBS leagues that I'm in with you, we do lose the guy if he's traded to the other league. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of dependent on your league. But I, I think Juan Soto is only going to get better. I, I I wouldn't expect him to get worse. Uh, I think his, like, numbers are sort of leading him to, like, you know, just as good on power and better average. And potentially, if he gets traded, a better lineup. Yeah. Uh, So let me ask you this. I mean, we saw Julio Rodriguez put on his show. And I guess just kind of for the... for, For everybody listening, if you didn't already know from his prospect pedigree and what he's done, like, he has more than the 26-ish home run pace that he's on for this season. Uh, would you rather have Julio Rodriguez or Juan Soto the rest of the season? And I know this is somewhat dependent on whether you need steals or not, but really the power is not that different. Um, I mean, expected batting average isn't really that different between the two. So, um, I mean, what are you thinking here, Gray, between, between Soto and, and Julio? Yeah, I don't I honestly I don't think they're that different. I'm taking Juan Soto uh a hair higher than Julio Rodriguez just because of the track record. Uh even though I think Julio Rodriguez can be better than Juan Soto in the second half because of steals. My concern now with R- Rodriguez is, you know, he's got that uh he's got a wrist injury, uh but you know, hopefully that's nothing and you know, it's just he was resting this weekend and he'll come back and he'll be fine. For the second half, it's a little bit of a concern, but yeah, I mean, not too much of a concern. Uh, hopefully, knock on wood. Yeah, it just the x rays came back or the MRI came back negative, it was just some bruising. So, hopefully, that'll co- go down and everything kind of resumes. I will take uh, Julio Rodriguez rest of the season, as you mentioned, the, the stolen bases are just going to prop up his value so much. Uh, <laughs> now, obviously, if you don't need stolen bases, then I'm leaning Soto. But even then, I mean, I, I think the case can be made that it's fairly fairly even. You're just looking at because we know what he. Other than the injury, any concern of the dreaded home run curse for for Julio Rodriguez? No, no. not really. No, it was actually uh, watching him uh, homer. I mean, it was it kind of reminded me of like you know some of these guys like. Tatis and Acuna uh, and Julio Rodriguez, like they just swing their, their swings are so easy and the ball just flies off of their bat. Like even Juan Soto was quote unquote, trying harder than Julio Rodriguez. It was just, it was just like, so it was beautiful to watch really. (laughs) I mean, especially those first two rounds, he was just flipping them out. Yeah. Left 
left field over and over again. You're right. Soto was putting a little little bit of energy. It looked like he was getting pretty gassed at the end. So I think everybody was struggling a little bit towards the end. But yeah, I mean, it's just it's just easy power from from J Rod. Um, I mean, we had the home run derby. Maybe MLB got excited by that because it seems like they might have brought back the 2019 balls for the post All Star <laughs> break. Because every good pitcher just got lit up this weekend. Gray, is this just kind of a a post All Star? blip or do we think that there actually may be some change coming yeah no i mean i hope it's a blip (laughs) because i got crushed in so many places like man it was like uh michaelis uh giolito uh robbie ray (laughs) it was like it was like i was getting ping-ponged around just getting absolutely crushed uh so hopefully Hopefully it's a blip, but it did seem like the ball was flying more this past weekend than it had been like in the first half, right? I mean, it's, uh, it I mean, did seem that way. It seemed like something had changed. I mean, Shane Bieber got lit up and knocked around. Um, you know, it, you mentioned a bunch of the other ones. I mean, Otani had a had a rough start. It's a it, it was it was an interesting set of games. I mean, the Blue Jays put up like put up a football score. It was ridiculous. Um, so I know I was saying to, I was saying on the site that it almost felt like that one game when the blue Jays put up 28 runs, it felt like that game alone, like eliminated the Red Sox from playoff contention. (laughs) (laughs) Just like demoralized it. Yeah. Yeah. It was like so demoralizing. It was like, ow, man, that one, that was was brutal. (laughs) I know I was actually, I got panicked. I was in, uh, we were in Vancouver and I got panicked that I had Ramiel Tapi on my bench for that game. I was like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> it ruined, it ruined one day of my vacation it, and, until I got back to the hotel room and I looked at my lineup. And I was like, oh, I did play him. Okay. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> yeah. I think maybe the, the only thing that I would, that I think is actionable at this point is, uh, and I talked about this actually on the, um, pot a that, that, Justin Mason did to raise some charity money this weekend is that there's a lot of guys who have career best home run to fly ball rates as pitchers right now that have put up some really strong numbers. And if, if they have adjusted back, I'm not saying necessarily the 2019 balls, but if they've adjusted them even slightly, some of those guys definitely could be in for some trouble. That's I know like one of the big names that I brought up was Tyler Anderson, uh, who actually had a pretty decent start, but like he's one guy where like career best home run to fly ball rate, it may not be sustainable if they did tweak the balls back to kind of what we've been used to seeing. But right now I, I think it's just a post all-star thing and uh, we'll see if everything kind of levels out. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, you know, Tyler Anderson, you're right on his Homer per fly ball. Uh, and it looks like he's got like his Homer per nine, excuse me. Uh, but you know, he also was on the Rockies for four years, so that could have definitely inflated his, uh, his Homer numbers. I don't know. It it is true. It is, uh, it is fair though. I was just looking at Tyler Anderson myself and seeing that his Homer per nine was really far down compared to his, uh, well, you know, for people who are listening, uh, I guess we should say, uh, his Homer per nine is 0.78. And his career number is 1.32. So it's almost half of what it usually is. Uh, So that would mean luck. But, you know, Dodgers, um, you get a few matchups that are, like, good with the the Dodgers. The Giants look, like, you know, pretty bad this year. Um, The Rockies in away games are a terrible team. Uh, so yeah, I mean, but you're right though. I mean, his numbers are, it does look like he's been a little bit lucky. Um, anyway, back to what you're saying. Yeah, it was just that I think that the really low home run, the fly ball, if you see guys that are uncharacteristically good against the home run this year, that may be the one area that I think you can sell high on those guys, show their ERAs to people, get them to buy in on them and then, you know, pick up, pick up a, another piece to help you with your run, whether that's a reliever, whether it's bad or whatever it may be. I think that's a potential area to look for some value here in the second half. Uh, speaking of looking for some value here in the second half, 
Um, Braxton Garrett, Gray. I mean, he's been he's been great for the Marlins so far. Um, I mean, we're we're looking at only nine starts, but three four two one one four ERA over forty seven innings, and now we also have kind of the uh, the Max Meyer injury, so he he has a little bit of security. So, what are you thinking here with Braxton Garrett? Uh, yeah, no, actually, um, a frequent commenter, uh, Vash, I believe, uh, hey, uh, hey, frequent commenter, Vash, uh, he mentioned in the comments that, uh, Braxton Garrett looks like he's putting up numbers that are, uh, look sustainable, and I was like, hmm, is that true? <laughs> I hadn't <laughs> noticed, like, honestly, like, there's so many players, like, I can't stay on top of everyone, so, uh, you know, it's like a matter of me just looking, but if you look at his numbers, yeah, I mean, Braxton Garrett's numbers really do look good, his velocity is up, his K per nine is uh, almost nine, his walk per nine is just over two, his XFIP is 3.47. Uh, it's good numbers. I, and the uh, and you know, like the Marlins, honestly, the Marlins are a, uh, a really like a solid pitching like uh, development team. Like they they develop pitchers yeah. really well. Like they're like they're always able to uh, you know they have the, the team wide famous uh, team change. The, the 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 change up that they uh, they love to uh, develop with their uh, youngsters. <laughs> I'm an oldster saying the word youngster, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I mean, Garrett looks good. He's he's developed a uh, he's got four pitches. His fastball's velocity is up, like I mentioned. His slider velocity is up a little bit. It's all working for him. Like I I don't know if it's out outside of like 15 team mixed league. If I'm interested yet. But I could be. I mean, if your team need is like you need a starter really bad in like a a twelve team mixed league, uh, and and he has good matchups for a twelve team mixed league. I think I'm looking at matchups still for uh, Garrett. But if you know a fifteen team mixed league, honestly, he probably should be rostered by this point. Yeah, I agree. In a fifteen teamer, he he should be rostered if he's not already. Um, in, in regards to his pitches and the added velocity, I know we've kind of talked about it before with like Esther Cortez, where he added some velocity in season and has lost some movement. Braxton has done, you know, the best possible thing where he's added a little bit of velocity and he's added a little bit of movement. So he has the best horizontal movement on all his pitches across, uh, you know, his, his limited appearances in the majors across three seasons. So far, he's got, um, you know, the best vertical movement on, I think, every pitch other than the slider. And uh, he's actually cut. He's he's kind of gotten rid of the change in the curve. They're really showy pitches. Um, so he's he's really focusing, throwing the four seamer, the sinker slider and just focusing on those three pitches. So there's there's tangible reasons why, you know, the numbers are looking the way they are with the velocity, with the movement, with the, the pitch mix changing, like all of this is moving towards what we're seeing from him now, which has been, you know, very, very quality starter for um, nine starts here so far. And really only like two that he got touched up on. The, his very first start was was against the Giants at home. And he, you know, they that was just a bad one. And his first one kind of chalked that up to nerves. And he had a tough one at St. Louis. But other than that, he's been he's been very solid. I actually, uh, I take back my shout out to uh, frequent commenter Vash, and I throw that shout out to uh, frequent commenter Nux, because that's actually who is the one who mentioned Braxton uh, Braxton Garrett. So, <laughs> sorry, uh, yeah. sorry, uh, Nux, <laughs> and uh, yeah, sorry, Vash. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get those. It's very, very, it's those. very, it's all very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> proper but anyway, you gotta you gotta give the props to the proper person. You know what I'm yeah, saying? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All about that here. You know, we definitely wouldn't be one of uh, stealing any information from anybody and posting it again. Uh, Ramon Urias uh, is. I mean, he's become pretty solid here. Is he becoming more than a waiver wire guy that you kind of just pick up when he's hot? He does have multi position eligibility. That's always nice to have. Special, especially in shallower benches, what kind of leagues are you looking at where Ramon Urias is is more than just uh, a streamer? 
Actually, uh, frequent commenter Vash mentioned Ramon <laughs> Urias. <laughs> so I got them mixed up. I knew they. I knew one of them had said one of them, and one of them had said the other. So uh, we're good now. I think we have. Uh, we've we've uh, properly uh, assigned our props. <laughs> Uh, so Urias for me, I mean, he looks like a hot bat. I mean, I honestly, because, you know, I mean, he's 28 years old. He's got 10 homers through, uh, through 242 plate appearances, 10 homers and a 263 average. The, the Babbitt looks fairly neutral. So he looks like a 260 hitter. He's got a decent strikeout rate at 22%, but he's got 10 homers. And he's got no speed whatsoever. At least he hasn't shown any speed in the majors. He had a couple years in the minors where he showed a little bit of speed, but he's not a fast guy. He's got like a 40-grade uh, speed. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think there's anything really here outside of like a hot bat right now. And then potentially, you know, like maybe – in a deeper league, sure, because he's got playing time. Like if you're in a deep, like if you're in a weekly, a deep weekly league, then he's probably pretty valuable because he's playing all the time and he's hitting well enough. But I don't see any upside from this. Like I, he looks to me like a 17 homer, 260 hitter with zero steals over the course of a season, which is like. I don't know. I mean, that's that's pretty bad. Honestly, that's that's like, you know, if uh, if Garrett Cooper were to be healthy kind of numbers. I mean, it's fine. Uh, Cooper, Cooper actually might actually hit more for a better average, too. So, yeah, I mean, he's a Urias is OK. I, I don't I'm not really that high on him, to be honest. Yeah, I think maybe the best thing going for him is, is really just that uh, he does have that multi position eligibility. So. You know, you can middle infielder, corner infield him. It's it's nice to have that flexibility. Um, and, and you did mention in July he has been hot, so I'm fine riding the hot streak until it ends. That may end right here with the All-Star break because it was going into the All-Star break that he kind of was hot. But he did have a home run this weekend, so potentially carrying it on. Um, I've picked him up in a couple of leagues where I've had some injuries here in the second half already. So uh, definitely a filler um, but I'm with you. I think other than in deeper leagues, he's pretty much, uh, and in those leagues, he's probably already rostered. I, I think he's more of just a, a pick him up and play him for now. Probably true talent, like a t- like what he is for the season, like a 260 hitter, um, not the like borderline 400 hitter he's been here in July so far. And also, like if you had, uh, you know, I know we have on our on our uh, list, we have to talk about Devers uh, replacements, but. He's a, you know, if he's got third base eligibility, which he should, then he's a decent replacement for Devers. Yeah, he should have it in pretty much your, every standard league uh, that has position eligibility gain during season at this point. Um, you know, we are approaching the second half here, Gray. I mean, let's talk about just kind of conceptually for, for our listeners. If you're leading versus if you're chasing the leader, what are some things that you're doing? Um, you know, I mean, you've come, you have plenty of... Uh, Plenty of history taking down some titles. So why don't you talk to us about your process as, as you start the second half? What are you doing? Uh, well, at this point, you know, the good thing about making a trade right now is you should have a good idea of what you need in your league. So if you can, like, drill down and, like, figure out exactly what you need in a league, then you should be able to pinpoint that piece in a trade. Like, if you need, you know, if you need steals, then you go out and maybe get a, like a uh, Estuary uh, Ruiz or a, uh, a John Birdie should be back, you know, in the next week or so. Uh, like, or if you need saves, then you go out and get maybe a closer. Like, or if you need a, if you need power, you maybe you take a flyer on like an Eloy Jimenez. Like, it depends on what you need. And at this point, you should be able to really pinpoint exactly what you need. So, and I don't mind losing like quote unquote, losing a trade. Um, this podcast is brought to you by quote unquote. <laughs> I think I've said that at like 15 times so far, <laughs> but anyway, like you should, like, I don't mind losing a trade. Uh, and by losing, I mean like giving a piece that is, you know, higher up in the rankings and, you know, like, Oh, like if you're trading, like you don't like, you should be able to get like a good, 
like uh you know maybe a return for like a uh i don't know like an alec manoa like you should be able to get a, a really good return for him but if no one's budging and you really need power and don't need a pitcher then trade him for like you know like an eloy jimenez and a hunter renfro like you're you're technically you might be losing that trade, but you're going to be winning it if you don't need pitching and you need power. So it's like it's just a matter of like team needs at this point. So I would that's what I would be looking at with like trade wise. Yeah, I mean, it, that's I think the biggest point in regards to trading is really it, it's about your needs. It's no longer necessarily about winning the trade. Obviously, you know, don't trade you know, the top player, Aaron Judge, for, I don't know, a crappy closer. But, John uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, like, with hey, the range. Hey, Gray, uh, hey, uh, hey, a long-time <laughs> listener, first-time caller. So, uh, you said to trade for steals with for John Birdie, so I traded I traded Aaron Judge for him. How did I do? <laughs> I went home runs for tra- for steals, Gray, just like you said. Uh, yeah, I, ow. <laughs> Yeah. So within reason, obviously, but yeah, you're, it's really about what you need. So, you know, if you're chasing steals, maybe you do get John Birdie as a piece, but obviously get something added on top that can also help you. Maybe it's an, uh, another top arm. Maybe it's a, a replacement power bat. If you're trading away a top Aaron judge, uh, you know, Jordan, Paul Goldschmidt type of type of bat at this point. Um, but yeah, just, just address your needs. And I think, also, one thing that kind of goes unnoticed is, you know, where can you actually gain points against your competition if you're chasing? Or where are they looking to gain points from you? So addressing your weaknesses or maybe even helping the people that are still above those guys maintain their place can be an effective tool, especially as we get towards the trade deadline and, and all the stats start to clarify a little bit more. Mm, yeah. All right, so, Gray, we can't have nice things. Max Meyer to the IL with an elbow injury. Um, I mean, there's a number of pitchers who who could kind of spot in here for the Marlins. Is there anybody you're potentially adding uh, and looking to to take his spot if Max Meyer isn't returning anytime soon? Uh, well, it depends on the league. I, I was saying to people, uh, so uh, Bradley Singer – looks great i mean his numbers actually we're talking about braxton garrett so bradley singer looks like braxton garrett plus 35 innings like it looks like bradley it looks like brady singer is uh is breaking out i mean it it does like i i don't know like if this is uh gonna be sustainable for the rest of the year or into next year, like, you know, but if you're going start by start right now, Brady Singer looks like he's made the jump to a, uh, you know, a, a definitely rosterable guy for every league. Like right now he's got a 9.4 K per nine, a 2.3 uh, walk per nine and a 3.31 XFIP. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's both, it's, it's being, it's a little bit like his velocity is similar and he's only got, he's got like three pitches, but he relies mostly on two, the fastball and the slider. And right now I would say it's like his fastball was kind of like, I I think it's because he's pinpointing it and his command has been like so good with uh, his pitches that I think he's like able to, you know, he's getting more, out of what previously wasn't much. So he's able to like put the ball exactly where he wants to, and he's inducing weak contact and it's, it's working for him. I think Brady Singer right now, you know, I was saying on, uh, in the round on Monday's roundup that like, he's a guy who like at this point, everyone, he should be rostered in a hundred percent of leagues. Like even the shallowest of leagues, he's doing well enough. Unfortunately, his next start, I think, is in Yankee Stadium. So, on a, like, no matter how good a guy's doing, I probably wouldn't start him in Yankee Stadium. It's just not worth the headache. So, like, that's a bench uh, for, you know, so it's, like, it's kind of tough in shallower leagues to pick up a guy and then immediately bench him. Like, you know, it's, like, how much room do you really have to juggle guys and make that call? But 
Singer looks great. Like if you're so if you're if a shallower league, you're out there and you're looking for a guy who you could potentially pick up. I definitely would be looking at Brady Singer. Yeah, and he's kind of adjusted a little bit too, and uh, but he's really kind of ditching the changeup. Um, the changeup's always been a little bit of a show me pitch, and he's really just going full sinker slider right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's. There's something here to see if, if this adjustment that he's made continues. Uh, really, just he his whole season, like if you take out, I don't know, two starts, like it, his numbers clean up so so fast. One against Houston. Uh, I, I mean, I hope you weren't starting him against Houston in, in the start of June. Um, and then he had one bad start against Oakland. Yeah, you probably were starting him against Oakland because they're, they're pretty bad. But uh, – other than that, though, like his, his numbers are really clean for the season. Um, so I don't even think his his ERA, if you're just kind of looking at ERA whip, the, the surface level is 3.82121 whip. Like I don't even think that really pulls together kind of the the what he's actually done this year. I feel like he's actually been a little bit better than that. So um, while the rest of the season projections aren't necessarily loving him, I do think there's there's something here, and he can at least be a streamer for me right now. Um, I, I'm kind of looking at him in the in the same way we were talking about uh, with Garrett. Are, are you a little bit higher on him? It sounds like yeah, a little bit, uh, barely, just because I think he's got a little bit of a bigger track record. But both are both are pretty close in my mind. Yeah, the track record, and then I guess he also has his his spot in the rotation solidified. If the Marlins get healthy, does does Garrett stay in the rotation? Do they monitor his innings? Uh, that's that's definitely something to consider as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, we can't have nice things. Our, our boy Rafael Devers, who I believe you and I have in a ton of places, uh, just he's heading to the IL. Let's let's just talk about some third base replacements. It doesn't sound like overly serious with Devers, so it's still a guy you, we're holding on to. Uh, I think even without a a IL IL spot, you kind of have to have to hold Devers. Yeah, no, completely. I you know. Unfortunately, like we were saying earlier, that uh, the Red Sox might be out of it. So, you know, that that's always tricky when a team is out of it. Then sometimes they slow play their hand with players. And like, you know, maybe Devers, maybe Devers would have came back like immediately after the IL stint if the Red Sox were in it. But since they're not in it, maybe he misses an extra like, you know, half a week. I don't know. You know, it's it's hard to say. I don't know how bad his injury is hopefully he's hopefully he's fine but yeah there's a couple guys that so like we mentioned uh ramon urias uh as a potential fill-in uh isaac paredes has been decent uh yeah. actually i grabbed uh emmanuel rivera uh the the royals guy uh, i grabbed him in oh, like one league uh, like maybe two weeks ago even before devers's injury uh just as a an al only guy so and he's been he was decent then for the like the the week previous to the um all star break. So maybe if he can stay hot a little bit, um, yeah, I mean, it depends on your league. like there's there's definitely gonna be leagues where, like, you know, uh, we're naming guys that are like deeper leagues, and there might be other leagues where it's like, oh, well, you know, do you like Wilmer Flores? Like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I did. I thought he was. I thought he was rostered in a hundred percent of leagues. But yeah, I, I like Wilmer Flores. I like Patrick Wisdom. I thought he was rostered. But if he's available, then go for it. You know. It, so it depends on your league. Uh, but yeah, I think they're hopefully. You know, hopefully Devers isn't out too long. Yeah. All right. I guess. Uh, so on the. Let's go on the higher end first here. If we're looking at replacements, um, Mankata was dropped in a bunch of leagues when he hit the IL. So let's go with Mankata, Baum, Santiago Espinal, or Gio Urshela. Who would you pick as your as your Devers replacement? Uh, Urshela. Actually, I remembered another name. Uh, so because Devers uh, is out. I I grabbed Bobby Dahlback in one fifteen team league. You know, it's a flyer, mm -hmm. so we'll see what happens. Uh, I don't I don't necessarily need much from him, uh, but 
you never know because of uh, you know because of the injury. Maybe Dahlback plays every day, and you know maybe something happens there. And also Jeter Downs uh, on the Red Sox. So there's those two guys. But uh, the names you mentioned before, uh, Yershella. I I like Yershella just in general. I think he's probably a little bit underrated. But yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on people's league and their needs and all kinds of different things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you have specific ones, obviously, you can always come ask Ray or I in the comments or on Twitter, and we'll get back to you. Um, I think I actually need to respond to a third, <coughs> a Devers replacement question on Twitter after we get done recording this. So um, let's talk about some some of the first-half performers here. I'm not going to spend too much time on these specifically, Gray, but just kind of walk through them. Tell me if they're a breakout, a bust, or somewhere in between, and, and we'll just kind of go through them that way. Um, I'm going to start with the first two because I, I don't really think there's much question here. Shane McClanahan and Alec Manoa. Yeah, those are two full, breakouts for full sure. Full breakout. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kyle Wright. Man, the Braves, the, Braves, the Braves, Braves really pitchers. scare me, dude. <laughs> <laughs> the Braves scare me so much. I honestly, I don't trust, like, I don't trust Kyle Wright. I don't trust Spencer Strider. Ah, uh, the Braves are like have freaked me out. Max Fried has managed to like be fine, even though the Braves scare me. <laughs> the Braves scare me. That's like, that not, sounds though. like uh, you know, like uh, a the on the back of my Braves jersey. Braves scare me. It's like <laughs> what what was that? Uh, me hate uh, you. Uh, me hate world or something. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, Kyle Wright. Ah, uh, you know, I think Kyle Wright is, I'm going to say breakout because his numbers support that, but not like, not like the McClanahan and Manoa breakout. So like those guys are on another level. Like I, McClanahan, I wrote a sleeper post in the preseason and Manoa, I was all about in the preseason. Like those guys had ace written all over them. Kyle Wright, I think is a solid, like. I think he's going to be solid. I don't think he's an ace, though. So right. I, I'll i say breakout, but with, you know, definite caveats. Right. The caveat that he he's more of a, like, he's breaking out to, uh, like, Jose Barrios pre this year uh, yeah. levels. Yeah. Where, like, yeah, he's going to be a good pitcher. You're happy to have him on your team. Is he elite? Probably not. I, I just don't know that the case. I, I think he still has some K upside versus what he's shown this year. But even with a little bit more K upside to get to like 26, 27%, that's still not necessarily elite numbers. And I think there's a little bit of regression in the ERA coming um, just just kind of based on what I've seen. Tyler Anderson, we talked about him a little bit. I'm going to get, kind of group him in We're here with Logan Gilbert. Tyler Anderson, Logan Gilbert. Uh, Anderson, I, I think is a, uh, I don't think he's a breakout. I, I think he's, I think he's having a good season. I, I don't, I don't buy into Tyler Anderson. Uh, Logan Gilbert, I buy into, I think he's got a good, he's got, even though they're both high command guys, like Tyler Anderson's got a great command and Logan Gilbert does as well. Uh, I, I Logan Gilbert's got higher upside, better K's. I, Logan Gilbert is a, a breakout. Um, he's he's solid. I, I have no problem with Logan Gilbert, but Tyler Anderson, I, I don't I don't buy it. Yeah. So I, I, we mentioned this this earlier: the home run, the fly ball, with kind of the if they happen to do something with the balls. Logan Gilbert for me is one of those guys that if they change the balls at all, I I am instantly off of him. Um, just like the home run, the fly ball for him has been. So kind. He's in the right park, obviously, for it, but he has been getting hit around. Um, he's second to last right now in hard hit rate. He's 107th in average exit velocity. Um, I just don't I don't love that. I, I think he's I think you're right that it's a breakout, but it's a breakout with some concern on the back end. And again, I'm not talking about the same level as the ace aces that we were were mentioning before. Um I think Spencer Strider might fit into an ace level if he continues what he's doing. Uh, you touched on Spencer Strider and the Atlanta situation. <laughs> I'm going to make you say one way or the other, though. <laughs> Breakout or bless Gray? Uh, <laughs> man, you know, I, I honestly, I don't really, I don't buy Spencer Strider completely. I, I have real problems with him. Uh, like, 
I don't think I'm out. I'm not out on them. I don't think I will be out on them next year either. It depend. They'll probably that might be price dependent, but I do think there is concern here. Like there was a reason why he came in to the season as like you know a guy that not that many people were like crazy excited about. Like he didn't have the prospect ped- pedigree like some other guys because. Like his command is so wonky, and he's really kind of like, uh, I mean, he's really he's he's really high fastball, and his fastball is really good. It's ninety eight plus, so that that plays for sure. Um, and you know, I I'm always the one who says like, you know, if a guy only has two pitches, it's not a big deal. If one of the pitches is you know so lights out that it doesn't matter, he only has one other pitch. But yeah, I mean, he does kind of have two pitches. Uh, I, you know, I I like Spencer Strider. His upside and his K's are so fantastic that it's hard for me to be completely, you know, negative on him because like his numbers and his fastball and that that kind of stuff like does excite me. But man, he is like I do think he's pitching a little bit above his like where he should be. Uh, you know, I don't know. He feels like a guy who could blow up like bad for a couple yeah. starts. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen it with a number of like high velocity fastball slider guys with control issues, just like throughout history of baseball, like Randy Johnson, Max Scherzer, like eventually became aces, but like early in their careers, they definitely had some struggles where they had to find the right mix, find the right arm slot, really get comfortable on the mound so that they could you know, knock those walks down to the point where they didn't have to strike out the side to get out of every jam. Um, right. That's, yeah, just, Ma- that's Max, a hard way to live. Max, uh, Max Scherzer. Yeah, they're definitely. And it's a good profile. Actually, I like that profile. If the profile is, you know, 13 plus K per nine, and all he needs to do is figure out command, that's a pretty sexy profile. Yeah. That profile takes, it's, it, sometimes it takes some detours through like unusability though. <laughs> Like it's, <laughs> it takes detours where you're like, oh, oh man, he walked five and an yeah, he gave walked up, five, uh, right, triple. walked five, gave up seven, and like <laughs> out in three, like, yeah. uh, yeah. So just just be warned, you know, anybody with that kind of control issue where you got a a K, or a walk per nine or a walk percentage over ten, that's that's always going to be a little bit volatile. But I mean, he has just it's just a nasty. Nasty stuff when you watch him. Uh, let's talk about a few bats here that have performed. Brandon Drury has just kind of like reinvented himself. I mean, we're talking about Brandon Drury for <laughs> crying out loud. Um, but like he's been he's been phenomenal. Gray is this another case of like one year Reds magic, and we should <laughs> no, just like dude. avoid at all the possibilities. Red, the one year Reds <laughs> magic is so crazy, man. The only person I think who has. Like, has anyone ever, like, taken the one-year Reds magic and, like, been, like, good for more than one year? <laughs> like, I mean, Tyler Naquin coming into this year, people were, people were convinced last year one-year uh, Red magic wasn't a one-year Red magic and would be a multiple-year Red magic, and it just was not a multiple-year Red magic. <laughs> like, it's Tyler Naquin. <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, and it's happened so many times. Aristides Aquino was a one month uh. red magic. <laughs> How about, remember, oh my God, remember Scooter Jeanette? Like, what? <laughs> There's been so many one year red magic guys. Like, it's fun for, like, if you have them during that year. I, I, okay, long story short, no, I don't buy Drury. <laughs> no. And this is ridiculous. All of a sudden, he's a 35 homer, 275 hitter. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what? That doesn't make any sense, man. No, I don't buy that. I, I, it, you know, if you had him this year, you stepped in it. But yeah, I wouldn't trust it over long term. Yeah, yeah. agreed. I think if you can if you can move him in any kind of dynasty keeper league right now to. You know, if you're not competing or just if you can move him for anything worthwhile, I'd, I'd go ahead and do that. Uh, the Reds thing is so, so weird how that happens. But I think it's a lesson for best ball leagues next year. I'm just going to draft all the crappy Reds that are there for one year deals. 
Yeah, no, completely, <laughs> man. I, I think that's a, I think, honestly, I think I've done that, like, unintentionally in my NL only. <laughs> like, I have, I actually have jury in a league or two. And I always do, like, it's always, like, a few of them. It's, like, you know, when you're looking at, like, guys, like, at the end of the draft and you're, like, mm, Kyle Farmer doesn't look so bad. <laughs> I mean, that park is good. The park's good. <laughs> Maybe Matt Reynolds isn't so terrible. <laughs> Yeah. All right, great. Uh, let's move on to another one. And I think this one is, again, more on the higher end. I, I think uh, Ty France, I mean, he's been great for really, like, back-to-back -back seasons. And even since his call-up in, in 2020, like, he's been a high average. Um, I mean, power is, is nothing really to write home for. But, like, is Ty France this guy? Is he, like, a 20-homer, 300 middle or top order guy just – Moving forward, can we just kind of bank this? Yeah, yeah, I kind of, I, you know, I really wish he was in a different park because, like, you know, you see how uh, Jesse Winker went from the uh, the Reds to the Mariners and how much, like, the park changed his whole profile that he became, like, a 230 hitter with no power. Like, if Ty France was in Cincy, he'd be, like, a 35 homer, 340 hitter. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, Ty France is Ty France is really a excellent hitter. Like people, I, I think people understand it and they they know it's just that his lack of power kind of gets people a little bit bored on him. But yeah, he is he's a solid. Like I want to say, like because in he's actually played exactly eighty two games. Um, so. That's easy for my brain to prorate. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a 24 homer, 300 hitter. And that sounds about right. Like he doesn't strike out at all. He's good. I mean, he's got no speed whatsoever, but yeah, 24 homers and 300, you know, it's, uh, it's like five homer five. Well, maybe 10 homers off of Goldschmidt, but uh, a little bit better on average. So, yeah, I mean, you know, even though Goldschmidt's uh, this year's hitting for like a crazy 320 average, which uh, actually Goldschmidt's usually a good average hitter. But anyway, long story <laughs> short, Ty France is solid. He's a solid 24 homer, 300 hitter. Uh, you know, it depends, I guess, how far that takes you. But that's, I mean, that's not bad. It's better than, you know, I would say probably better than Jose Abreu, but close. I mean, yeah. close, but better in like, you know, it depends on what you need a little bit. Like if you want power over average, then maybe Abreu over France, but not that different, really. It's just kind of six of one, a half a dozen of another. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think coming into the season, like, Maybe people didn't buy it, but now we're looking at him, and it's it's kind of uh, ridiculous looking back that he went, you know, 40, 50 picks after, like, the LeMahieu Cronenworths of the world, which are basically what he's doing right now. And really, he's on the high end of what, you know, you would get from a DJ LeMahieu or a Jake Cronenworth because they're, they're really not mid-20s power uh, other than LeMahieu's, like, random – pop-up year that he did it so uh yeah i mean i i think uh ty france is maybe underappreciated uh and maybe undervalued for for drafts next year um but yeah if you're chasing some average i, I think he's probably a very consistent one here mm, yeah uh kind of two guys on just the opposite ends of the spectrum a little bit bobby wood jr top prospect he's kind of forming into what we would hope he would be Showing the power speed combo. Tommy Edmond kind of came out of nowhere. And, I mean, we talked about the the random Reds years. I mean, the random Cardinals years <laughs> might have, might have like, just as much say on, on it as the random Reds years. Uh, I really wish the Cubs could steal some of this NL Central random year magic because uh, we never get this <laughs> crap. Yeah. Actually, Tommy Pham had a random Cardinals year, and then he went to the Reds to have a random Reds year. <laughs> <laughs> he, he bounced from random year teams. 
Uh, yeah, though the Cardinals are kind of like they they Cardinals just invent players. Cardinals are just like Brandon Donovan is going to be a player now. Like what? What? Yeah, yeah, he's a player now. Like uh, okay, like the Cardinals went so far as this, they're like like walking down an aisle in Costco and they're like Lars Nutbar. Yeah, that's a that's a player now. Like uh, is it? Yeah, that's a player. Um, okay. Anyway, so. Bobby Witt Jr. I like a lot. Uh, I think Bobby Witt Jr. is almost not quite in the class of the Julio Rodriguez's, but he's close. I think Bobby Witt Jr. is a superstar. Um, you know, I'm worried a little bit about the injury that knocked him out on Sunday. Uh, we record this on Monday, so I don't know. I don't know yet. Like, uh, you know, short term, I don't know what's going on with Bobby Witt Jr., but I think he's a superstar. Um, Tommy Edmond. I think people kind of like, I think they've priced him kind of correctly at this point. I think he's like around a 75 to 85 overall guy with like, you know, I think he's got like 30 steel speed, uh, maybe 12 homer power. Basically what he did last year, like last year he was an 11 homer, 30 steel, 262 hitter. That sounds about right. I mean, you know. And if he does the exact same thing as he did last year, again, this year, it's hard to like, you know, play dumb and be like, I don't know what Tommy Edmond is. I mean, he, I mean, he <laughs> seems like if he does it two years in a row, that's kind of what he is, which is I, I think that's usable in most leagues. I, I like Tommy Edmond this year. I actually drafted Tommy Edmond in a bunch of leagues this year because he was I think he was priced well this year to draft him like he was undervalued in drafts in March. And uh, yeah, I ended up getting him. I like him. I think he's, you know, people were scrambling for steals and Tommy Edmond was a, he was solid for a while. Like at this point he's moved out of the leadoff spot because he has gone cold recently. Uh, his K's are up a little bit. So that's a little bit of a concern, but I think the Cardinals are going to play him. I'm not too worried about it. Like, who else do they have? And Edmo- speaking of a Cardinal make a player, Edmundo Sousa, like, <laughs> where Edmundo Sousa just was like, oh, yeah, we invented him last year. Now he's no longer a thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, I, Tommy Edmund's solid. I, I think he's probably undervalued a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it, it has kind of started to go a little bit in the other direction. But yeah, I mean, he's pretty much been kind of the 260 hitter um with with the the speed i mean that's that's kind of what he is and and in regards to wit yeah i mean i think he's he's not at the julio rodriguez level where we're we're talking about julio rodriguez as a i mean he's in the discussion for one-on-one next year i i would think uh just given the the power speed potential that he has whereas wit's probably more of like back in first middle of second type of area um, just because I, you know, I, I think the tools may not be quite as loud as, as they are on Julio. Yeah, that's fair. And, and maybe a little bit more struggles th- that we've seen from wit than we have Julio. So, uh, just, just kind of the eye test potentially there as well. Yeah. Anything to really mention here in the bullpen gray? I mean, I, I didn't really see any changes in regards to injuries or potential openings. Um, I do know that uh, JKJ wrote a, an article recently about some possible reliever trades. Um, but anything you want to talk about here in the bullpen? No, no, not really. I think uh, Robertson, uh, the Cubs closer, David Robertson, seems like he's going to get moved. Uh, so I would guess Wick there. Um, I don't know if Daniel Bard, like Daniel Bard should get moved. But then you have the Rockies, who are really a dumb organization. So they'll probably be like, no, we're not moving Daniel Bard. He's our closer. <laughs> <laughs> what would we do in the ninth inning without him? So I don't know. I mean, maybe if he gets moved to Carlos uh, Estevez, uh, possibly. Um, you know, Lou Trevino, I, I would guess, get mo- gets moved. I would, I would assume um, Jackson is is the fill in maybe Jimenez is back and gets saves. Um, the pirates have said Bednar isn't getting moved, which 
I mean, you know, they're like, it's such 3D chess. I'm assuming that means he is getting moved. I don't know. <laughs> and Scott Barlow, I guess, could get moved. Um, Josh Stalmet, uh seems like the natural fill-in there. I don't, you know, it's some of these guys. The problem is, too, like, if a guy gets moved, like, say, um, you know, say Bednar gets moved, the Pirates are already not a good team. <laughs> Like, you know, if he gets moved, uh, I, De, La Sosa, uh, uh, De Los Santos seems like the guy, but what's he going to get the rest of the way? Five saves, maybe, at most? Oh, I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, you know, so some of these, it depends on how deep your league is and how badly you really need saves, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, and I think in really competitive leagues, unfortunately, the guy like the top guys on the list that you would want probably are already owned. So like, Sir Anthony Dominguez has been great regardless of whether he has a reliever role or not. He's probably already owned. Carlos Estevez, when he's you know he's been great, and you just maybe don't pitch him at home. Um, so there's some of these guys, Danny Jimenez. Uh, you know, some of these guys are probably already owned. And those are probably the guys you want. Um, but if you're just chasing, if you're just absolutely chasing quantity of saves there's some names for you any waiver wire guys before we get out of here Greg? uh yeah steven kwan um after uh taking a three month sabbatical seems like he's getting hot again <laughs> uh there is uh daniel vogel back got traded to the mets better uh better lineup i don't know uh i don't know if you're like gonna see like sometimes also it, not necessarily. Well, Vogelback was a platoon guy, kind of with the Pirates. But this is also something to consider that, like, a guy gets traded to a better team, and sometimes that better team just wants him as a platoon bat. So Vogelback goes to a better lineup, but is he really going to play every day? And that seems doubtful. So yeah, Vogelback got traded. Maybe that's that's a little bit of a boost in value for him. Um, Ramiel Tapia, as I mentioned earlier. I don't know if it was a matter of the Fenway, um, you know, for Tapia or just Red Sox pitching was being awful for the weekend. But Tapia had a great weekend. Might be a hot bat. Um, you know, uh, I think anytime a guy goes to Coors. So Jose Iglesias, the Rockies are going home for, I think, six games. I, I want to say six games. But anyway. Iglesias, maybe. Uh, Joey Votto, if he was dropped in your league, he had a homer on Sunday. He might be heating up. So, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, Ramon Urias. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, uh, JJ Blade. JJ Blade. <laughs> Jar Jar. Jar Jar Blade uh, on the Marlins. He got called up. Might be something. Um, I don't know. Uh, he's, uh, he's a power bat first and foremost. Not much on average. Uh, I think he was hitting like 228 in the minors, so that's not going to be great. Uh, he doesn't really have much speed, even though he stole base on Sunday. But he could have playing time with Jorge uh, Solar out, so there's that. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's about it. You got any other guys? Yeah, I got some pitchers I'll, I'll let throw out there before we get out of here. Um, Reed Detmers, since coming back from AAA, he's looked a lot better. Um, that's... Just for everybody that followed my Detmers love in the preseason, this is the guy I thought we were going to get, not uh, not the first half read Detmers that got sent down to AAA. Justin Steele has been great for the Cubs. Uh, so, I, I mean, if you're just looking for a streamer, there's one for there. Cutter Crawford has been nice since he's gotten the call up. Um, Dustin May is down in AAA doing rehab starts. He should be back soon for the Dodgers. I don't know, actually, if he's getting slotted into rotation or not, but... Somebody to look at if you're just uh, trying to find some some names that are maybe a little off the radar. Um, and then if you're just looking for some RP fillers, you know, sometimes just getting <clears throat> relief pitcher innings that are clean is is worthwhile. Um, Brock Burke, AJ Puck are a couple of names that you could put out there that aren't the, you know, Clay Holmes types that are already owned. I mean, Clay Holmes is now a, a top reliever, so he's been owned for a while. But, um, you know, Starting a relief pitcher that goes multiple times in a week can be just as effective as starting a bad starter in a non-ideal matchup. So uh, perfectly fine with that. And I think that's about all I got for this week, Gray. All right. Cool, man. 
Yeah. So everybody, always you can follow us on Twitter. I am at Razbeaton. Great is the at Razball account, of course. If you have specific questions, you can hit us there or in the comments on the post on Razball or on the video on YouTube.com slash Razball Fantasy. And we'll talk to you next week. Late.